Okay, so tonight's talk is going to be on the uh, Ediacaran or the Ediacaran, depending on uh, how what your pronunciation is. Cool little graphic. So this was life's first explosion before the Cambrian explosion. So a little bit about the uh, geologic time frame here. Um, this is what we're kind of uh, used to as far as the geologic time uh, scale. Uh, but actually what we're talking about here is right down in this section here. Uh, right, uh, uh, the Ediacaran uh, represents the last of the Precambrian. And this was actually life's first explosion. And it isn't something that uh, um, people are taught or, or heard anything about. So just a little bit about the uh, geologic time scale. Um, I kind of did a little bit of this in the deep time lecture. So just to go over it again a little bit, uh, usually most of what people think about is the geologic time scale. What I just showed before is only this section right in here. So we also have the uh, Paterozoic, the Archean, and the Hadean. So this is... Uh, uh, about 4 billion years of, of Earth's history that most people don't talk about. And what we're going to be talking about, the Ediacaran, is right here, right in the last of this uh, Neopaterozoic time frame. So usually we're talking about billions of years here instead of uh, just simple millions. So what had happened during the, um, the, during the last of the Precambrian is that the... Uh, uh, around 600 million years ago, uh, Earth actually was in a what they call a snowball Earth condition, uh, where uh, most or if not all of the entire planet was uh, covered in a one giant um, ice sheet or a glacier. Uh, so this was called uh, snowball Earth. And this uh, we think actually happened uh, at least three times uh, during the uh, Precambrian. So the last of, the, uh, last of these events uh, happened about 600 million years ago. So um, when we're talking about the Ediacaran, uh, the, um, or Ediacaran, uh, Earth was just coming out of this uh, last of the snowball Earth events. Um, and it was actually kind of a nice uh, time uh, for the life forms that were around at the time. So before this, we simply only had um, um, single-celled uh, um, plants and animals, um, and we didn't really have any multicellular uh, life at this time. So the ice uh, finally melted, and uh, the reason for this, they think, is was increased volcanism that happened as a uh, consequence of the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia. So the volcanic uh, CO2 built up to about uh, 0.01 uh, bars. Uh, the ice melted catastrophically uh, in geologic time frame. That's only within a few thousand years. And the surface temperatures briefly climbed up between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. Um, in, in Fahrenheit, that would, uh, that would be very hot. <laughs> uh, essentially, um, uh, I think uh, room temperature is like around 35, 36 degrees Celsius. So it briefly would have been uh, very, very hot. Um, and the CO2 was rapidly removed by silicate weathering forming uh, cap carbonates. And this is what the uh, landforms would have looked like at this time around 600 to 650 uh, million years ago. Uh, so this was the uh, supercontinent of uh, Rodinia. Um, they actually think now that, uh, you know, most people think of uh, supercontinents, they think of uh, Pangaea, which was the last supercontinent that was around uh, about 250 million years ago. Uh, they actually think now that the uh, Earth goes through several of these uh, supercontinent uh, breakup and then back to super, supercontinent uh, cycles, uh, which happen every 500 million years. Uh, so this was the uh, supercontinent that was before Pangaea, called Rodinia, and it was the breakup of this uh, supercontinent that led to all the volcanism that brought uh, Earth out of the um, uh, Snowball Earth event. 
Uh, so these are the types of uh, preservation that you get in the um, Ediacaran uh, beds. Um, you won't get any original material in these beds. It's just way too old. Uh, so most of the time, you're just going to get molds and casts, uh, carbonate molds and casts, uh, casts under ash, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so several of these uh, localities um, are actually this kind right here, where it's molds and casts that are uh, in a ash bed. So what had happened there was that uh, um, the fossil locality was near one of these um, volcanoes that was erupting during the uh, Ediacaran, and uh, uh, volcanic ash would uh, fall onto the surface of the ocean, uh, and that would filter down through the um, through the water column and provide a really nice uh, fine um, ash bed for the fossils to uh, uh, make or the uh, animals to make imprints in uh, to make fossils. So this is how Rodinia uh, broke up. So it goes from this is a, a, a kind of a movie. Uh, from 600 million years all the way till today. So this is 600 million years of continental drift. And it's kind of kind of neat to watch. Okay, so here's uh, the major localities for the Ediacaran uh, biota, uh, places where you can find them. Uh, we're mostly going to be uh, looking at three of these localities. Um, there's one in the White Sea in Russia, right here. Uh, there's another one here uh, at the tip of Nova Scotia called Mistaken Point. And then there's the type locality here, the Ediacaran Hills in South Australia. But these uh, localities are very few and far between. So these are the three localities that we're going to be talking about tonight. And so the Ediacaran uh, lasts from uh, 635 to 541 million years ago. And this is this fauna is the first multicellular fauna to exist and uh, was the first uh, explosion before the Cambrian explosion. So the first locality we're going, we're going to be talking about is the type locality. This is where the um, e Ediacaran uh, fauna was named after. Uh, so this is the Ediacara Hills in Australia. Uh, so this is uh, the first locality where this fauna was uh, first described. Uh, so here's the Ediacara Hills. It is in the middle of nowhere. It's just this little tiny outcrop here. Um, here's some ripple marks that you can see. And uh, here's a bunch of people that are uh, collecting these fossils. And this is one of the uh, uh, fossils that this locality is uh, very famous for, uh, called uh, Dickinsonia, which we're going to look at later. Um, this uh, and other sites around the world are so um, uh, so important to uh, paleontology for study uh, that they have made these uh, UNESCO sites um, or World Heritage sites. Um, so. There's no general fossil collecting. You have to be, um, unfortunately, you have to be a, a scientist studying this material to actually go and collect fossils at these localities. And there's a lot of uh, red tape and paperwork that you have to fill out in order to go collecting these. Another locality that we're going to be talking about tonight is Mistaken Point in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, it's right at the tip here of this island. And this is what the locality looks like. It's just this really weather-beaten, um, uh, sea-beaten uh, locality. You can see that the layers have been tilted up uh, through geologic uh, forces. And again, here's some uh, scientists uh, studying this material. And here, again, you can see ripple marks. Um, if you look very closely, all these people are wearing blue booties. Uh, that's so that as the people are walking around on the ground, they don't uh, wear down the fossils with regular shoes. Um, so yes, there are a lot of um, a lot of uh, steps that you have to take in order to go and visit these fossils. But it is in the middle of nowhere. 
so here's the formations at a uh, mistaken point. Um, so this, that cliff that you saw that had all the terraces, these are all the different formations that are, that are exposed at that uh, uh, locality. So all these formations here actually record uh, these fossils. Uh, here's the third locality. Uh, so this is the White Sea in Russia. And this locality is actually on this peninsula right in here. Uh, so this is pretty, uh, here's the Kola Peninsula. Uh, so that it's very close to the Arctic Circle. Um, the Kola Peninsula is actually very famous for minerals. So it's very close to that locality. Uh, and this is what the locality looks like. Again, it's just a upturned, um, uh, uh, very fine uh, volcanic ash beds uh, that preserve these fossils. So these, these uh, beds have actually been so upturned that they're actually on their edge right now in that photograph. So this is kind of what the Ediacaran biota looks like. Very, very unusual. Um, it's actually very difficult to, to even um, classify uh, what these uh, particular things are a lot of times. Um, sometimes it takes a, a lot of imagination, uh, but these, these um, uh, organisms are so far removed from anything that we have today uh, that they almost defy classification. Um, some of the classifications that we do have are actually kind of just an educated guess. Uh, but most of this uh, fauna uh, actually died out uh, uh, before the Cambrian explosion actually happened. Uh, so that um, uh, these animals are, are, are extinct and don't really have any um, or very few uh, living relatives or even relatives that made it through the extinction event. Uh, into the Cambrian explosion. So one of the first animals that we're going to look at is the first animal that was uh, uh, discovered from this um, this uh, uh, biota, um, the uh, Ediacaran biota. So this was first found in 1957 by Roger Madison, a schoolboy in Charnwood Forest, Lancashire, England. It had been seen a year earlier by uh, Tina Nagus, uh, then 15-year-old squirrel girl, uh, had this fossil a year before uh, the boys, but her geography, uh, I, actually I can't read it. Um, so it was a possibility of Precambrian fossils. So they, they didn't think that, they, they had kn known the age of these uh, rocks um, at the time, uh, so finding, a, a, they, uh, at the time, uh, they didn't think that there was any fossils that were uh, this old, that were older than uh, 541 million years ago. Uh, so uh, they totally discounted um, this being a fossil uh, a year before. And then Roger Madison uh, found it in 1957 and uh, brought it to the attention of somebody, and it actually wound up being a fossil. Uh, again, we're actually not entirely sure what this thing is. Um, we know that it was uh, kind of similar to what we call a sea pen today. Uh, so this would have been anchored to the sea bottom, and it has a fractal type of uh, uh, symmetry, which most animals don't have today. Uh, fractal meaning that you have um, pattern upon pattern upon pattern, repeated, 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 all the way down to the microscopic level. Um, a lot of the animals back then had this fractal design, and uh, they think that that was to um, increase their surface area to allow for absorption of nutrients through their, uh, through their skin. So uh, these are interpreted as being a type of sea pen uh, but uh, again, these things are so far removed from anything that we have experience with today that this is just a educated guess. So this is another Charnia. So most of these are fairly small, um, maybe about a foot or so, uh, maybe up to two feet. Uh, but these things couldn't get to be quite long because this uh, pattern that they have here, this uh, fractal pattern, 
can just re be repeated and repeated and repeated just to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's a very, uh, um, uh, what is it, um, efficient design. Uh, but we don't have any animals or plants that uh, uh, really reflect this uh, fractal design anymore today. Here's another charnia from another locality, and you can actually see its uh, uh, root base right here, where it would have been anchored to the seafloor. Another uh, fairly common uh, fossil that's found in multiple uh, areas uh, that uh, represent these um, uh, Ediacaran biota is uh, uh, Kimberella. Uh, Kimberella is, um, they uh, interpret as a proto mollusk. Uh, so it had this um, muscular foot, this ruffled muscular foot. Uh, we actually really don't know what the top of uh, Kimbriella look like because we're actually dealing with only with the bottom portions of the uh, imprint of the fossils. So we really don't know what the top part of a lot of these animals look like. So you have uh, some interpretations up here uh, that kind of look more like, um, actually looks more like a leech to me. Um, then you have more that look more like a uh, mollusk with a shell on top. Uh, with a ruffled bottom and a, kind of like a snorkel or a proboscis coming out. Uh, there is evidence of this um, proboscis in this particular fossil down here. You can see the Kimberella impression right here. And then there's all these little scratch marks. Um, so what they probably did was sit in one spot and then was able to extend its proboscis out and feed so it doesn't have to keep moving. Here's another uh, Cambrella impression. Now these these things are relatively small. They're, um, um, I'd say maybe about a quarter of an inch. I haven't seen too many of these uh, more than a, a quarter of an inch. And this is my specimen down here from the White Sea, uh, White sea in Russia. This is one of my favorite animals from the uh, Ediacaran biota. Uh, this is called uh, Dickinsonia. Uh, there's several species of uh, Dickinsonia. Um, most of them are only about the size of your thumbprint, uh, but they could get large as well. Uh, uh, there are some that are um, up to three meters in, in uh, diameter, um, about, about three feet in a meter. Uh, so they can get uh, fairly large, like a bath mat. Uh, so they're very, um, uh, again, they kind of look like a fingerprint to me. They have this uh, usually a central bar going down their um, later, uh, the lateral line. Um, and then they have all these uh, radial patterns on either side. Uh, this more than likely is the um, oldest animal. Now, how do we know that it's an animal and not something else? Well, before uh, this particular um, scientific breakthrough, uh, they actually didn't know what these uh, what these organisms were, um, but the, uh, evidently they they found some uh, ones that were very well preserved, and did some chemical analysis on them, and found out that uh, they preserved um, uh, traces of uh, cholesterol, and cholesterol is a animal only uh, protein, so. This is definitely our, our oldest ancestor that we know of uh, because of cholesterol. Isn't that nice? <laughs> uh, here's another unusual animal. This is called uh, uh, Spragina. Uh, this was from the uh, Ediacaran Hills in Australia. Uh, so this is, um, again, uh, probably one of our uh, early ancestors. Now, it doesn't look like it would be one of our ancestors, uh, but it actually is. Uh, the reason for that is that this is the oldest animal that has a head, it's got a tail, and they think that, of course, it being a head up here, it, most of the uh, um, its mouth, uh, its sensors, and all that stuff would probably be on the head part. Uh, so this is the first animal that we know of that moves with direction. 
um, most of the other animals would have been uh, similar to uh, sea urchin, where it could go in any direction it wants to. It doesn't really have any any particular way that it has to move. Um, these are the first animals that we know of that actually had a direction because they had a head and a tail. Uh, not only that, but this uh, animal also had bilateral symmetry. So if you cut this animal in half, the right side looks exactly like the left side. And we're animals that have heads and tails, and we have all of our sensors packed into our head, and we have bilateral symmetry too. So that's uh, several of the ways that we're related to this animal. Now, um, more than likely, this is probably the precursors of trilobites, because they had a very trilobite-looking uh, body plan. So these probably were proto-trilobites, although it's not a trilobite itself. So this uh, particular organism here is called uh, Fractofrucus uh, maseri. Um, so it's, uh, or miseri. Uh, miseri uh, being from its, uh, from its, it's from mistaken point in Canada. And fractofrucis, uh, meaning that it's, uh, it's got a fractal type of design. So again, it's fractal uh, for it to, um, uh, probably to absorb uh, uh, nutrients from its environment by increasing its uh, surface area without increasing its body size. Uh, here is another fairly common fossil that's uh, found in these beds. I believe this one is from a locality in uh, uh, Russia, and uh, there's another one in Poland. Uh, these are called uh, uh, Numelia simplex. Um, other than it's some sort of a fossil, we know that it's an organism. Uh, they're interpreted as being a type of jellyfish, jellyfish uh, but there really isn't enough there to, to really be able to tell. It, uh, we, we really don't know what these things are. Uh, this is another uh, type of fossil that's found in quite a few of these uh, areas. Um, it's got a threefold design to it. Uh, and as far as I know, there aren't any animals that uh, today that have this threefold design. Uh, what this fossil represents, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows yet. Because uh, again, we're only dealing with an impression in a rock, so so really really don't know what these uh, what these organisms were. Uh, this one's from Ediacaran Hills. Uh, this one is from um, uh, the Russian locality, White Sea. And this one's from Mistaken Point. They call these things pizzas because they're round and kind of looks like it's got stuff on it. So it kind of looks like a pepperoni pizza. Uh, this one is from uh, Mistaken Point because you can see these... Uh, um, Fractofrucis fossils here. Uh, this one's from the Ediacara Hills. Uh, but again, we have absolutely no idea what this what this represents. We know it's something, but other than that, your guess is as good as mine. So again, it's like we find a lot of these fossils, um, but trying to interpret them and figure out what they are and what they're related to and how they're related to each other and if they're related to anything today. Uh, unfortunately, when you study this this stuff, you'll be the first one to study it, but it's, it's very uh, frustrating to try and uh, figure out what this stuff is. But these are all different types of fossils that are found in this lo these localities. And um, yeah, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, it's more than likely that these things here, these little round things with the things inside of it, uh, these are probably holdfasts. So this probably would have, would have been a colony of those uh, charnias or something similar to that. So these were a holdfast to uh, hold it to the uh, bottom of the floor so the currents didn't sweep them away. But uh, yeah, other than that, we don't have a clue. So here's some uh, some of these fossils that are um, on some stamps from Australia. 
So we get the Kimberella and those other kind of things. So the next one in the series is going to be the uh, Cambrian Explosion. So that's it. Let's see. So, um, oops, stop sharing. So does anybody have any questions? I'll be open for questions. Derek, can you tell us how the Burgess Shale is different? Because that's a uh, E.E. Akron too, right? Well, yes, that's actually going to be in the next lecture. So the 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 Burgess Shale is a uh, uh, that's Cambrian explosion. So believe it or not, this this uh, uh, biota actually predates the the stuff in the Burgess Shales uh, okay. by about 94 million years. So the weird thing is is that um, there's more more of a time difference between the Burgess Shale and these Ediacaran fossils than there are between us and dinosaurs. Because there's only 65 million year difference between us and then the latest of the dinosaurs, uh, but there's 94 million year difference between Burgess Shales and the Ediacaran Hills. So that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> I assume they'll probably be finding a lot more of these sites, right? Oh uh, yeah, I'm sure. As as the, the um, somewhere, right? yeah, as as the uh, as you know, of course, as more and more of the Earth are are uh, explored and our understanding increases, I'm sure that there'll be more. Um, the reason why this stuff kind of um, forgive the pun uh, exploded onto the scene uh, was because again, most people uh, prior to uh, you know the 50s and 60s. Uh, just weren't looking in rocks that were this old for fossils because it was common knowledge at the time um, that there were no fossils in this time frame. And and believe it or not, most rocks that are this old don't contain fossils. Uh, so they just weren't looking. So now that they're looking, I'm sure they will probably be finding more. Uh, so uh, actually... Um, uh, just to let you know, the uh, Mistaken Point and uh, the Ediacaran Hills are both uh, World UNESCO sites, and they are trying to get the uh, White Sea locality to be a UNESCO site too. So I was actually lucky to get lucky enough to get uh, some fossils from the White Sea locality before that happened. <laughs> Any other questions? And please remember that you have to unmute yourself in order to ask a question. <laughs> Do you ever see these for sale now? Every once in a great while, you will see uh, these fossils for sale. Um, of course, almost all, all the uh, fossils that you can get uh, are going to be from the uh, White Sea locality, uh, but they are not cheap. Um, I've actually, uh, I have a, a slab that contains uh, two, uh, two species of Dickinsonia uh, on a slab. And it was, uh, and I actually thought I got a good deal on it. It was $1,000. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> it's, this stuff is fairly expensive. Uh, you can get a, a, a Kimberella uh, for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, they're relatively common. Um, that uh, I've actually been trying to get one of those uh, um, uh, circular uh, guys that have the three three uh, sections in it. Uh, I've been trying to get one of those, and uh, I've gone over a thousand dollars, and I keep getting outbid. So yeah, those those ones are hard to get. Um, getting anything rare like this as uh, uh, Sprugenia, um, I've never ever seen one of those things for sale. And I'm sure it would be multi, multi thousands of dollars if, if it was. So, any other questions? Oh, come on. I wasn't that good at explaining it. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Okay. I guess that's it. That's all I got. Unless you want me to show you some stuff. I do have one question. I just couldn't get my microphone to work. <laughs> okay, I got you. Just are these 
things that are fractal? Are they the only things that they found that have these this fractal um, pattern? It's a very good question. And yes, you are correct. That is the that these are the only animals that have ever been found that really have these uh, fractal designs. And um, actually, these these fractal uh, uh, animals uh, went extinct um, at the end of the Ediacaran, uh, right when the uh, Precambrian explosion was uh, uh, supposed to explode. So it was the um, Cambrian explosion that uh, uh, made these uh, fractal animals extinct. Uh, but they were um, again. It's it's very unusual. Before I started uh, doing research to do this uh, lecture, I had heard about the Ediacaran, but it's not really something that's talked about. Um, this is a, a, a again that the this is a time frame that lasted for uh, 94 million years, and these animals were very successful. Um, another interesting thing about the Ediacaran uh, fauna was that there were no predators. This is the one and only time frame in Earth's history where animals existed in peace and didn't have to worry about getting eaten by something else because it was actually the Cambrian explosion uh, where things like uh, predators uh, started to evolve. Uh, so our first super predator um, was in the Cambrian explosion. So this was a time and only time uh, in Earth's history where you didn't have to worry about getting eaten. <laughs> Thanks. So, that answers your question? Yes. Okay, cool. Anybody else? How do we know none of those things weren't predators? Um, well, we don't have any evidence of uh, any hard parts uh, like um, uh, bones and teeth and um, we don't, w w any of the uh, fossils that we have don't show evidence of, of either evolving um, teeth or jaws uh there aren't, aren't any fossils that we've ever found that have had bite marks taken out of them um so pretty much uh think that this was a pretty much a peaceful time in in earth's history and um pretty much every, any uh, everything that was uh subsisting was subsisting on either eating algae or or something uh similar to that uh grazing on on you know, whatever kind of um, pond scum was coating the rocks, uh, or was uh, filtering stuff out of the uh, out of the sea column. So we don't have evidence of any of that kind of material uh, until we get to uh, the Cambrian. So that's when we get uh, animals like uh, uh, Nomalocaris, where all of a sudden it's a two foot animal with jaws and teeth and spines and bitey bitey bitey. So. Yeah, that's the Cambrian explosion. I have a question. Wouldn't there have been a time when there would have been no more space? If, if, no, if no one was eating each other, wouldn't there have been a, an issue of overcrowding? Um, not well, not that we can see. Um, you know, for the the small evidence that we have, it seems like everybody was uh, pretty much uh, fairly well spaced. Um, so yeah, we don't really have uh, evidence of of that. But uh, you know, of course, the the few localities that we have that preserve this time frame, uh, these are only you know, very small snapshots of, at at the time. So um, you know, there might have been in other localities, but we just don't have fossils preserving that uh, that environment. Uh, so yeah, these are these are just rare rare snapshots. But in the snapshots, we don't really have that much of a problem. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? You got to unmute yourself, Dave. Uh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Yeah. I just thought I'd ask, um, you did mention one or two times along in the presentation about along the way in the in the future, if there is to be some amount of more research that's to be done in looking at these um, types of organisms um, based on the type of information that you've researched what would have to be basically initiated to come across more localities where <laughs> it's it's more, trips. yeah 
besides that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. well, unfortunately, I don't think we have anything in New Jersey that uh, or within driving range that uh, where we could uh, probably look for for stuff mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, you. Um, in order to get stuff that that's this old, you really have to go to the cores of the continents. Uh, what mm -hmm. they call the 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 cretons of the continents. Uh, that that's where the all the old stuff is. Um, so uh, yeah, it would uh, um, be a fair fair bit of drive in order to get to some place where we could actually go collecting this material. I wasn't asking that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What was your question then? I was, for some reason, I was actually listening to my wife. <laughs> oh, so what was your original question? Oh no, you answered. You pretty much. Oh, well, I was just you know, <laughs> how would you know if, in the future if there's to be more research into into this, you know, finding these kind of locations. Would it be more or less uh, something that would require, uh, I guess, you know, I guess grant funding or, I mean, you know, large scale exploratory? Um, yeah. It, it's, you know, it always comes down to time and money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, especially uh, uh, right now, there, um, uh, there's there been some research into it, but there hasn't been a lot of research into it. So if you're going to, you know, if you want to to jump on the bandwagon, this would definitely be a, a good spot in order to uh, jump on the bandwagon to to do some research. Um, but the caveat to that is that it again, it is quite frustrating. Um, you know, you're not dealing with uh, uh, complete animals. Uh, you know, it would be kind of like uh, finding finding a T Rex only preserved from the knees down and then trying to reconstruct mm -hmm. what the animal is with no bones there. So mm -hmm. yeah, it would, uh, it is kind of frustrating, mm -hmm. but, um, it is kind of cool though. Uh, actually w uh, one of the forefronts of, um, of, of fossils and paleontology is, is doing chemical analysis on, on a lot of these fossils to, to find out what's going on. Um, this is a, a forefront. They're actually, do, uh, you know, putting these things into uh, doing, you know, spectrographic analysis and uh, chemical sniffers and all sorts of other stuff and finding out what kind of chemicals are actually in these bones and teeth and impressions and stuff. And that's actually one of the one of the ways that they found uh, this um, cholesterol preserved in this uh, Dickinsonia. Uh, mm. They're actually doing doing it on the molecular level. Uh, and finding out, finding, you know, finding that kind of stuff. Um, another, another thing that they've done recently is, is fossils don't preserve color very well. Mm. So it's always been um, kind of up to artists' uh, imagination to find out what color some of these animals are. You know, when you see re uh, reproductions of some of these things in, in, um, you know, magazines and books and, and uh and and museum displays the color is is very subjective mm -hmm. uh, but yet um i heard uh just recently within the last year or so uh they did chemical analysis on the uh dinosaur eggs that were found in china and found out that they uh had a chemical in there that suggests that they were robin's egg blue mm. yeah. the carnivorous dinosaur uh, these oval, oval raptor eggs that were maybe about this big, oval eggs, uh, were more than likely a robin's egg blue. Yeah. So, Incredible. but again, that that isn't something that you could see in the fossil. Um, they actually just look uh, brown right yeah. now, yeah. Um, or whatever color the the sediment is at the time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this is all all you know on a molecular level. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. That yeah. that that's the essentially that's the uh, the wild wild west now of the paleontological world is is doing all these. It's it's in a in a molecular lab with bubbling test tubes. <laughs> <laughs> that's scientist stuff. <laughs> uh, a lot of times they're actually finding fossils. Uh, right now, they're actually finding more dinosaur fossils already in collections than they are out in the field. 
because nobody has the money to actually go out into the field uh, that much anymore. And they're go actually going through the, the stuff that they that they have in their already in their collections and finding new dinosaur species. Mm -hmm. That's kind of kind of cool too. Uh, a lot of a lot of times, what they're doing is they're actually taking the sediment that's in and around all the dinosaur bones and looking for smaller stuff. Uh, the paleobotanists are are looking for fossilized seeds and nuts and pollen uh, to find out uh, what environment these bones were found in. Mm -hmm. Um, and reconstruct what the how you know what the dinosaurs were eating and that kind of stuff. Uh, there was a um, uh, almost a complete uh, ankylosaur that was just uh, discovered um, actually about ten years ago up in Canada up in a mine. Uh, they just uh, uh, announced they uh, did a study on its stomach contents and found out what the dinosaur what it, what the last meal of the dinosaur was based on paleobotany. Mm -hmm. So yeah. There's a lot of a lot of stuff still coming out. You know, you think that uh, everything that's known is already known, but uh, there's still a lot of stuff being found. Mm.